Hello everyone, welcome back to the March edition of North Korean Movie Reviews, where today we are taking a look at yet another film from everyone's favorite Korea, except for the people who escaped. Today, we'll be inserting ourselves into the everyday lives of the average North Korean family with Heyeondong-i Du Gajong, which means two families in Haeundong. Directed by Lee Kwan Am and released in 1996 at a time when absolutely nothing bad was happening in the country at all, especially not a crippling famine, tanking economy, and the incompetent leadership of an amateur filmmaker turned dictator, Two Families in Haeundong tells the stories of two scientists and two families who happen to treat their families very differently. So, with that in mind and no restraint on spoilers, let's dive straight into Two Families in Haeundong. The film begins with a panoramic shot of the only city in North Korea that wasn't starving at the time, Pyongyang. We're then taken inside an apartment where one of our protagonists, comrade Ok Jeon Su, scolds her husband for staring at a picture of a singer, Song Yang Hui, which is hanging on their wall. He denies this, and the couple happily sweet talk each other and show some skinship, which I must admit is actually kind of new for one of these kinds of films. <laughs> During their flirtatious bout, John Su notices a moving truck arriving. Remembering that they have new neighbors moving in today, she goes to see who her new neighbors are. As fate would have it, their new neighbor is the singer that is hanging on their wall. John Su introduces herself to Yong Hui and asks where her husband is. After some pressure from her peers, she replies that he is not there and that he is at work, causing everybody to look concerned. Meanwhile, the scene shifts to Yang Hui's husband, fresh from his divorce from Ri Hyang in Urban Girl Comes to Get Married, working tirelessly to pay child support, I mean to support the nation's industry by saving as much nickel as possible. His boss, worried for his health, urges him to go home to his wife for working so hard. Yeah, a boss giving a damn about his workers, how realistic. Eventually, the husband, who's known as Ryu Jin, comes home to Yang Hui, working by herself around the house with their son, Pyo Li. Ryu Jin thanks her for all the hard work she's done and takes over the chores for her while she cooks. All we need is a little domestic violence and we have the perfect nuclear family here. All is well until a meeting in John Su's flat where Yang Hui observes John Su's husband taking care of dinner while all of the women are attending the meeting whereas Yang Hui's husband allowed the rice to burn because he forgot to check on it. <laughs> Dismissing this disappointment, Yang Hui suggests that they visit John Su's apartment together, to which Yu Jin reluctantly agrees. This only leads to more disappointment from Yang Hui, however, as she watches John Su's husband describe how much he loves and cares for his wife, John Su. When he asks Ryujin if he's happy being married to a famous singer, Ryujin is uninterested and instead chooses to look over a welding book that Jansu's husband had given him. Jansu's husband urges Ryujin to talk more, and in what can be described as extremely rude, Ryujin announces that he must do something he discovered in the book and promptly leaves. Yang Hui ashamedly apologizes on behalf of her husband's behavior and leaves, her head hanging all the way. Yang Hui follows her husband outside and a fight ensues, with Yang Hui asking how he can embarrass her like that and to think about what others would think of them now. Yu Jin offers a non-apology and says that she knows how busy he is, but offers to make it up to her by inviting John Su and her husband to her birthday party. <laughs> Yang Hui stays up late into the night, overlooking her sleeping son. Thinking back to the past memories of him not being around for important dates like their son's first birthday, she laments at how she cannot bear to live like this anymore, with her husband constantly busy and ignoring his family. <laughs> Your 
John Su, her husband, attend one of Song Hui's concerts with their daughter Pomi the next day. When Yang Hui observes how well John Su's husband treats his daughter, as well as Yang Hui's son Pio Li, Yang Hui confides in John Su about how she wishes her husband could be like John Su's husband and be more attentive to his family. John Su, along with her husband, then hatch a plan to help Song Hui's husband Yu Jin to pay better attention to his family. Meanwhile, the manager at the factory where both Yu Jin and John Su's husband work approaches John Su's husband with a stack of books for him to study in order for him to find a way to produce metal welding rods without using nickel. What an entertaining plot device. Despite studying the books all night, John Su's husband comes the following morning to break the news that it's essentially impossible to forge these welding rods without nickel. All seems lost until the manager is told that a man has found a way to make the rods while saving 80% of the nickel. And let's all guess who that is, everyone! Meanwhile, Yang Hui arrives home late at night and overhears Chung Su and her husband flirting through the evidently thin-ass walls in their apartment, leaving Yang Hui full of dread as she longs for the same type of companionship from her husband. She puts her son to bed and silently weeps by his side as she longs for the happiness she had long ago, as symbolized by a ceramic vase they'd gotten as a wedding present. <laughs> Morning comes as we see Chon Su's husband spending time with his daughter Palmi, you know, actually being a father. While Chan Su happily makes pajun, a really good dish by the way, they sell it at Trader Joe's. We're then shown Yang Hui's morning, where her husband briefly comes home, only to say that he's bringing food to go back to work. <laughs> Having been pushed to her breaking point, Yang Hui throws her spatula in a fit of rage and tells him that she wants a divorce. <laughs> Unable to cope with her husband not taking her seriously, she pushes her son to the ground when he comes into him crying that her husband didn't buy him a toy gun he'd wanted. <laughs> Meanwhile, the neighbors hear them fighting through the really thin walls and come rushing to make sure everything's okay. Yang Hui then explains, well, here, don't let me tell you, hear it for yourself. おりまれ봐요。 당신의 시간에서 조금만 떼내서 가정에 돌려주길 원하는데 왜 당신은 그것마저 못 들어주나요? 전 지금껏 모든 것을 참고 견뎌왔어요. 남들이 퇴근하면 부부간에 같이 국장 구경도 가고 유보도를 거닐 때 명절 때면 온 가족이 떨쳐나 친정집 나들을 갈 때에도 나만은 아버지를 찾는 별이를 껴안고 빈방에 홀로 앉아 있었어요. 그때 저희 심정이 어떠했는지 당신은 생각이나 해봤나요? 당신은 제가 저와 구기를 걷지만 당신한테 달려 있는 아이야 저는 그만큼 불행해진다는 것 왠지 끼려져서 안 해요. 정말이지? 난난 난 옆집 범이 엄마가 부러워서 못 견디겠어요. <웃음> <laughs> Yang Hui leaves the apartment only to find the women on her floor waiting outside. She brushes past them with her crying son attempting to go with her. 
Finally, one of the older women goes in to speak with Yujin and tells him that the party says it's important to work hard, but also to spend time with your family. The days go by like business as usual with no changes. But Yujin works for days at a time while Yang Hui grows more and more jealous of Jonsu because of how her husband treats her. This comes to a head once again when Ryujin comes home to an empty house with a note addressed to him from Yang Hui, stating that she and Ryujin are at a crossroads, and that he has until she returns from going on tour to decide if his job is more important than his family. Meanwhile, John Su happens to notice in passing that Ryujin has the same books that the factory manager gave to her husband and confronts him about this at home. Her husband denies giving Ryujin the books, and Jansu confronts the manager herself, claiming that those books are only furthering Ryujin's drive to work non-stop instead of being with Yang Hui. The manager denies giving them to Ryujin and says that Jansu's husband gave the books back to him after he couldn't figure them out. Frustrated, the manager goes into Ryujin's apartment without knocking, because that's normal, and tries to take the books from Ryujin. But Yujin refuses and tells the manager that he is working on something groundbreaking. It's here that the manager, and everyone else including Chansu, learns that Ryujin is the mystery man working on a way to produce the welding rods without imported nickel. Ryujin, in true North Korea fashion, finally confesses that the reason he's working so hard is because of how he doesn't want the country to trade away its beautiful resources to those disgusting foreign nations in exchange for nickel, because of how hard Kim Il-sung fought to take the country back from the Japanese, and that doing something as benign as foreign trade is destroying everything that Kim Il-sung did to make Korea great again. And no, by the way, I'm not making references to Donald Trump. This is the literal translation of what he said that I'm giving you here. Ryujin concludes that any criticism he gets for being a neglectful father and abusive husband are a non-factor, as he views it as his responsibility to save as much of Korea's resources as possible by working. Even so much as one tree for the glory of Kim Il-sung's Korea. It's f***ing ridiculous. Stunned. The manager tells Ryujin that he has the purest heart of any man he'd ever met, stunning and brave, as Ryujin's tear-shedding Kim Il-sung stroking discourse on Juche drives everyone to tears for realizing how wrong they were to tell Ryujin not to work 140-hour work weeks for the glory of Juche and Kim Il-sung. We now see the film take a dramatic shift in tone, as now Ryujin is seen as the heroic worker who puts the nation above all else in the positive light. While John Su's husband is portrayed as lazy and unmotivated for balancing his work with his family, as depicted in the scene where he returns home to John Su, who remarks that he's become lazy, laments that what made her attracted to him was when he used to work so much when they'd first met to the point where he forgot his own mother's birthday. <laughs> There is no discourse or arguing whatsoever about Chansu's sudden 180 on the issue of spending time with her, and her husband blindly agrees to work more for the glory of the country. How fucking realistic! Despite the film now taking the stance that staying home with your family overworking is bad and anti-communist, the film's portrayal of Ryujin from this point on portrays him doing precisely that, staying home and taking care of his son Pioli while thinking about Yang Hui, repairing their television set and repairing the vase she'd shattered during their fight. Even confessing to the manager that he is irritated about how long the research is taking as he'd promised to throw Yang Hui a birthday party for her when she returned from her tour. <laughs> Hey, 
와선 후회하게 돼. Young Hui eventually returns home to find their flat completely renovated with all of the things Yujin had promised, like the toy gun for Pyoli and a functioning television. Young Hui is greeted in her home by the manager's wife, who tells her of Yujin's hard times since she'd left, and tells her of his accomplishments and how lucky she is to have him. Young Hui and Pyo Li eventually run into Jeon Su and her daughter Pom Mi. With the tables reversed for the first time, with Jeon Su jealous of Young Hui, she tells Young Hui that her husband is now working with Ryu Jin, and together the quartet head into a local bar where their husbands are having drinks. Once inside, they observe Jeon Su's husband urge Ryu Jin once again to stop working so hard, posing the question if it's worth working all week for his research only to come home to see his neglected wife and son crying and unhappy because he's never around. Jeon Su, despite agreeing with her husband's point of view for three fourths of the film, now drops her groceries and runs away crying because reasons and furthering the plot and stuff. Her husband comes home only to hear that she no longer wants him to pay attention to her like before, saying that she wants real love like what Eugene gives to Young Hui. Oh my god, how f***ing hysterical is this movie, Jesus Christ. Essentially, she says that she no longer wants to live for her own desires and more or less wants her husband to be gone all the time and work for the glorious nation, and to disregard her and their daughter's needs for the nation. It's now Jeon Su and her husband's quarrel that the Ajuma Supreme Court has to intervene in. It's Jeon Su's husband who strikes his daughter, like Yong Hui, her son. It's Jeon Su who runs crying, like Yong Hui did before. Now it's Jeon Su fleeing, only to have flashbacks of their past when her husband was more like Ryu Jin. Later that night, Ryujin comes to Yang Hui's side and delivers more or less the same speech he'd given to the manager from before, that the country is being sanctioned more and more every day, and that if scientists like himself had been less selfish before, then the impact of those sanctions could have been mitigated. He goes on to say that happiness doesn't come from the blissful apartment they live in. Happiness comes from alleviating the burdens and grief that befall General Kim Jong-il, whom he is quick to point out that allegedly only gets two hours of sleep per night. Probably because of the fucking orgies in Hennessy, dude. Ryujin continues by saying that the harder he works, the lesser number of documents requiring money and attention will befall Kim Jong-il's desk, and that doing that for the general is what will bring everyone true happiness. In the closing scene, we're met with Jeon Su addressing the crowd at the factory by announcing that the nickel-free welding rod was successfully invented. She chooses not to mention Ryujin and instead asks the crowd to cheer for Yong Hui instead for supporting and understanding the needs of the party to come before her. She's given a round of applause for her devotion to her husband, while Jeon Su smiles at her now disgraced husband, indicating that she still believes in him. The film ends with Yong Hui, now completely devoid of any human emotions or needs like any good communist, walking happily with flowers in hand, 
ready to be another cog in the machine of totalitarianism. This film has got to have the most fucked premise I have ever encountered with these movies. It takes the self-centered, neglectful attitudes found in a forest of swing, coupled with a desire to work for the betterment of yourself and the country found in My Look in the Distant Future, and just dials that shit up to 11. What really surprises me about this movie is just how blunt it is with the theme of it, that you're just supposed to work for the happiness of the leader and not for yourself. It doesn't even try to hide it, nor does it say that you'll be rewarded or even benefit from it. They all literally just say you have to work nonstop for the pleasure of the general, and any and everything else is not important. Take the contrast between Yong Hui and Chan Su's families, for example. In any other movie, Chan Su's husband would be viewed as a shining example of what a man should be. He balances his work in order to spend time with his family, he treats his wife with the love and respect that she deserves, and is not neglectful to his daughter Pomi, whom he spends time with daily. All of which sends a shining example to his daughter Pomi about what a good man should be. North Korea, however, does not agree with this mentality. To North Korea, Ryujin is the exemplar figure of what a man should be, one who works not for the happiness of his wife and child, but for the nation. While Chansu's husband is depicted as a lazy, selfish deadbeat for having the audacity to be a good husband and father. This can't help but make me feel so sorry for the women who live in North Korea and are expected to view this twisted, disgusting take on familial relationships as normal and to be complicit in it. This movie essentially teaches young girls that a man who works constantly, no matter how neglectful or abusive he is, is what they should be attracted to. And that a man who makes time for his family outside of his work is lazy and disgusting. Pomi overhearing Chansu call him disgusting and unattractive for not working himself to death and being with his family will only teach her to expect the same neglect and unhappiness that Chansu will endure. And that a woman's job is to be patient and not to question her husband's dedication to his work or risk being outcasted as selfish or unpatriotic essentially robbing North Korean women of the right to express feelings of unhappiness or discontent, stripping her of any emotions or feelings she may have had before, essentially turning them into machines whose only purpose is to give birth, raise said child in an unhappy, unfulfilled marriage, and then die. And the implications for men are dire as well. Ryujin's son, Pyoli, is expected to see his father's neglect of his wife as something righteous that every man must do, as well as working all day every day for the glory of the nation. This movie delicately strips all of its characters of emotion and feeling, swiftly transforming them into cogs in the ever-encroaching authoritarian machine of socialist Korea. As far as the acting goes, this is pretty standard for North Korean movies, always average with no one breaking the Confucian mold that is expected of them. As is expected of North Korean movies in the mid to late 1990s, the propaganda with this film is extremely heavy, to the point of insanity for the aforementioned reasons. Characters cry out in tears over not being able to do enough for their beloved, sleep-deprived comrade Kim Jong-il, who I'm sure is so stricken with grief when he isn't busy consuming his daily diet of lobsters and Hennessy, or sleeping with multiple underage girls at a time in one of his 17 mansions across the country while his people starve. I really don't have anything positive to say about this one, guys. It lacks the charm of oh youth, the innocence of urban girl comes to get married, and it lacks the emotion of my look in the distant future. To me, this movie is just a reflection of just how bad the situation in the country was in 1996. The only thing I found remotely interesting in this film was when Yong Hui threatens Ryujin with divorce. Divorce apparently being extremely taboo in the DPRK, I found it interesting that they would have had Yong Hui say that. Although in hindsight it was probably used to reinforce Yong Hui's selfishness by having her dare to utter the word divorce in a society like North Korea. There is one scene that's actually very powerful, which is the scene where Yong Hui explains how Ryujin's constant absence is destroying their family during their big fight. Once again, however, this is twisted and contorted later in the film to make Yong Hui look like the bad person, instead of it rightfully being Ryujin. Like in the movie Our Fragrance, the movie exhibits a large rise in nationalism, conformity, and xenophobia that is in sharp contrast with the so-called 
golden age of North Korean films in the 1980s, where these themes, while still present, were far less intense in their scope. No longer was North Korea able to portray a semi-realistic, idealistic take on life in the DPRK when economic times were good in the 80s. Now the only purpose of the North Korean movie is to instill the citizen with the idea that working non-stop for the country is his only purpose, and any semblance of genuine humanity is a ghost of a bygone era. The overarching theme in this film is nation first and nothing second. This is Jesse from Chosun Yongha Review, everybody, and I hope you all have a great day.